Our world is a tapestry woven with stories of heroes, villains, and legendary creatures straight out of ancient texts. Today, we embark on an odyssey into the realm of biblical monsters, peeling back the veil on enigmatic beings that have fascinated and spooked generations. The Bible, a treasure trove of narratives, introduces us to a menagerie of extraordinary creatures that blur the lines between natural and supernatural. These beings, veiled in mystery and symbolism, hold a special spot in our history, leaving us pondering their origins, meanings, and their eternal significance. Join me in today's adventure as we plunge into the tales of these mythical creatures that have endured through time. From the awe-inspiring leviathan with scales like armor and breath of fire to the gargantuan behemoth, dwarfing even the mightiest of humans, we'll uncover the secrets of these creatures that have both terrified and mesmerized across generations. Before we begin I would appreciate if you would like the video so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. If you are not subscribed I recommend you to subscribe and activate the bell so you don't miss any video that are uploaded every day. Alright, let's keep rolling. Let's start with Behemoth, the colossal figure in the pantheon of biblical monsters. Mentioned primarily in the Book of Job, this beast has ensnared readers with its colossal size and mysterious nature. Yet, despite its terrifying presence, Behemoth doesn't play a central role in the Bible. Some might even argue it's more like a power move by the Biblical God, flexing to show Job, who was questioning divine power, just how formidable the Almighty truly is. The God of the Bible uses Behemoth as a teaching tool, implying that there's a vast unknown in the world beyond human understanding. Picture this majestic creature, look at Behemoth, created alongside you, munching on grass like an ox. It's got muscle for days, a tail swaying like a cedar, and limbs of iron. It's a masterpiece, yet even its creator can confront it with a sword. Job 40 verses 15 to 24 From this vivid description, we gather that Behemoth is a beast of unparalleled strength and grandeur, an untamed force that humanity can't even begin to challenge. Interestingly, despite its imposing stature, Behemoth seems to have a herbivorous diet, grazing on grass like a docile ox. This contrast between its immense power and gentle diet hints at a deeper complexity. Efforts have been made to fit Behemoth into earthly categories, stripping it of its mystical nature to grasp its essence. Some see it as a literal creature, potentially an extinct species like a dinosaur, although the timeline doesn't match up. Others propose tamer ideas, like Behemoth being a gigantic hippo or a mutated hybrid of several large animals. Then there are metaphorical interpretations, viewing Behemoth as a representation of cosmic or societal forces, embodying the untamable aspects of our world beyond human control. Interestingly, Behemoth shares the biblical stage with Leviathan, representing the clash between land and sea, order and chaos. Behemoth, the land creature, and Leviathan, the sea dweller, create a dynamic interplay that some say embodies opposing elements perhaps good and evil or chaos and order. Now, let's shift gears to the first beast in the book of Revelation, a vision witnessed by the Apostle John, a creature rising from the sea with ten horns and seven heads. John describes it as resembling a leopard with bear-like feet and a lion's mouth. 
The fusion of these animal features paints a complex and formidable image, baffling both John and us, the readers, with its sheer strangeness. Scholars often interpret this beast as symbolic of oppressive political powers or regimes throughout history. The seven heads symbolize dominant empires, while the ten horns represent subsequent authorities arising from these empires. It's a vivid depiction of the recurring cycles of oppressive systems that have plagued humanity for ages. Another interpretation sees the first beast as a symbol of idolatry and false worship. Its borrowed characteristics from lion, bear, and leopard signifying its prowess in seducing people into embracing false gods and indulging in sinful practices. These biblical beasts, whether literal or symbolic, serve as powerful lenses through which we explore the mysteries of our world, the constant dance between order and chaos, and humanity's role in the grand narrative of creation. They challenge our imaginations and beckon us to fathom the unfathomable, inviting us to ponder our place in the vast unknown of existence. This interpretation urges us to resist worldly temptations and underscores the significance of standing firm in one's faith. John continues to describe the first beast, warning us, this creature was granted power to speak arrogant and blasphemous words and exercise authority for 42 months. It blasphemed God's name, his dwelling place, and those who reside in heaven. It was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and conquer them. All inhabitants of the earth whose names weren't written in the Lamb's Book of Life, the Lamb who was slain since the world's creation, will worship this beast. Revelation 13 verses 5 to 8 John's description hints at a prophecy or a cautionary tale, indicating that those not registered in the Lamb's Book of Life, essentially those not chosen to be saved, will fall prey to the beast's words and end up worshipping it, forsaking their connection to God. For believers, this might be one of the most unsettling creatures in the Bible to grasp. It won't strike with violence but instead will allure mankind with its words, leading them astray from eternal salvation. Some interpretations see the first beast as a symbol of the Antichrist or evil itself. Its blasphemous nature and claim to authority align with the concept of a malevolent force opposing God's divine plan. This interpretation emphasizes the eternal clash between good and evil, urging believers to resist the temptations of malevolence. Moreover, certain theologians link the first beast to the first-century Roman Emperor Nero, known for his oppressive rule. It's not hard to see why contemporaries might associate him with the beast. Nero was even believed to be behind John's exile and numerous brutal executions. Whether seen as a symbol of oppressive powers, idolatry, or embodiment of evil, the symbolism of the first beast imparts crucial lessons. It urges vigilance, fortitude, and a commitment to righteousness in the face of adversity. Now, on to the second beast, which shares the stage with the first in the book of Revelation, emerging from the earth with lamb-like horns but speaking with the cunning of a dragon. This contradictory image signifies the deceitful intentions of the second beast. John describes it in Revelation 13 verses 11 to 14, detailing its authority and ability to deceive humanity. This creature is often perceived as a collaborator with the first beast, working in tandem to deceive and manipulate people. It showcases great feats 
even conjuring fire from the sky, aiming to persuade the masses of its divine arrival. These tactics aim to deceive people into following the first beast and embracing its ideologies. The second beast, as described by John, holds the power to animate an image of the first beast, compelling all who refuse to worship it to face death. This emphasizes the power of deception and calls for discernment, reminding believers not to be swayed by false miracles or leaders. Many believers consider this second beast as the false prophet anticipated to appear before Jesus' return, aiming to dissuade followers and lead them astray. Despite its lamb-like appearance, its actions portray a false prophet role. John notes how it deceives Earth's inhabitants and enforces a system where those who oppose it are killed. This same system also enforces the infamous mark of the beast, 666, upon every person, controlling their ability to trade or survive. These characteristics of the second beast spotlight themes of political authority, influence, and control, reminding us to stay discerning and resolute against deceptive ideologies. Understanding the significance of this beast encourages upholding moral and spiritual truths in the face of worldly challenges. Moving on to the locusts of Abaddon mentioned in Revelation, these creatures contribute to the prophetic narrative of the world's end. John describes the destructive events that unfold during the end times, specifically mentioning the fifth trumpet, the locusts, described as terrifying horse-like creatures prepared for battle. These locusts possess crowns on their heads, hinting at some form of divine authority, and faces resembling human visages, suggesting intelligence and strategic thinking. As John specifies in Revelation 9 verses 1 to 5, they're granted power like scorpions, inflicting torment upon those not sealed by God. Some interpret these locusts as a plague, a repercussion delivered upon humanity for their continual sin. The righteous appear to be unaffected, while those lacking God's seal on their foreheads are pursued violently for a period of five months. Here, some argue that these locusts represent one of humanity's final chances to amend their ways. They're not there to kill, but rather to compel a realization of wrongdoing and the need for atonement. After these five months, it's implied that those attacked might have a chance to correct their misdeeds and strive for righteousness. Those who don't might face something much worse than just the stings of these scorpion-like locusts. Describing these creatures in Revelation 9 verses 7 to 10, John illustrates them as resembling battle-ready horses, with crowns like gold, human-like faces, hair akin to women's, and teeth resembling lions. Their presence suggests a message of impending battle, signifying their violent nature. They are unyielding and unreasoning, leaving us feeling powerless, much like frightened villagers in the path of ruthless conquerors. Their human-like faces seem a reflection of our own predicament, a reminder that they embody our own vices. Believers may interpret this as a force reflecting humanity's self-inflicted horrors, forcing us to acknowledge our transgressions. Moreover, John reveals that these locusts are led by the Angel of the Abyss, named Abaddon in Hebrew and Apollyon in Greek meaning destroyer. In some traditions, Abaddon is a fallen angel or an angel of death. It's fitting that he leads these deadly locusts, perhaps under God's command, indicating the severity of this divine retribution upon humanity. 
Now, turning to the book of Daniel, it transports us to a time when the Israelites faced captivity in Babylon. Amidst this foreign land, Daniel, a devout Israelite, rises to prominence in King Nebuchadnezzar's court. The book combines historical events with prophetic visions, weaving a captivating narrative. In Daniel's dream, he witnesses a sequence of four beasts emerging from a turbulent sea. These creatures symbolize influential kingdoms and rulers that would shape history. The lion with eagle's wings represents the Babylonian Empire, majestic and swift in conquest. The bear with three ribs in its mouth signifies the Medo-Persian Empire, voracious in expansion and domination. The leopard with four wings and four heads signifies the Greco-Macedonian Empire, known for speed and fragmented rule. Lastly, the fearsome beast with ten horns and iron teeth, plus an additional boastful horn, forecasts the rise of the oppressive and blasphemous Roman Empire. Amongst these beasts, the fourth in Daniel's vision troubles him the most. This beast is described as terrifying, equipped with iron teeth that crush and consume its victims, leaving nothing but trampled remains. It's highlighted as different from all the other beasts, indicating its distinctiveness and the presence of ten formidable horns. Daniel further details how a smaller horn emerges among them, uprooting three of the original horns. This little horn boasts, claiming supreme authority, until the Ancient of Days, likely Jesus, arrives, destroying the beast and casting it into a blazing fire. Daniel elaborates that while the first three beasts are stripped of their authority and allowed to survive for a period, the fourth beast faces immediate obliteration showcasing its exceptional power or possibly the necessity of its total annihilation. An angel confirms to Daniel that this beast, symbolizing a king, will dominate and oppress God's holy people. The little horn, representing this king, subdues three other kings, representing the other beasts, and asserts dominance. This tyrant's malevolence prompts the persecution of devout believers, encouraging others to follow him under threat of torture or death. Daniel associates this with the Antichrist, who will rule before Christ's return, diverting people from God and thwarting their ascent to heaven. The author might have been referring to the Roman Empire of that time, considering the persecution faced by God's chosen people under Roman rule. This fourth beast might symbolize the destructive might of the Roman Empire, with the horn representing Nero, also associated with the first beast in the Book of Revelation. Alternatively, some interpret Daniel's vision as alluding to a potential future revival of a dominant empire, similar in scale to Rome. In this interpretation, the warning is for a generation yet to come, a caution of an evil, globally influential figure who will deceive and rule over humanity. However, according to Daniel's prophecy, the Ancient of Days will overthrow this tyrant, and only those steadfast in their faith, resisting the lure of evil, will be saved and rewarded. The portrayal of the dragon in the Bible, particularly in Revelation, solidifies its position as one of the most fearsome entities depicted. With its seven heads, ten horns, and a scaly red body, the dragon requires little description to convey its ominous appearance and malevolent nature. It's later identified with Lucifer, the fallen angel, and ultimately as Satan himself. In Revelation 12, 
an enormous red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns descends upon a woman, often interpreted as the Virgin Mary. The dragon seeks to devour her child, Jesus Christ, to prevent the rise of his greatest adversary. Lucifer, once a favored angel cast out of heaven for his jealousy and arrogance toward God and humanity, aims to strike back by annihilating the Son of God. If he could eliminate Jesus before his messianic role, it would seemingly extinguish hope, righteousness, and salvation for humanity. Despite Lucifer's efforts, God intervenes, rescuing the infant Jesus and protecting Mary. A great civil war in heaven ensues, leading to Lucifer's expulsion, transforming into Satan, the deceiver of humanity. In frustration, Satan turns his malevolent attention towards those who adhere to God's commands, waging war against the most righteous. The dragon, symbolic of Satan, embodies evil, chaos, and spiritual opposition. Its ultimate defeat symbolizes the victory of Christ and the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. Understanding the symbolism of the dragon offers insight into the theological themes within Revelation and conveys a message of hope and triumph. Shifting to the Nephilim, these biblical giants elicit awe, intrigue, and fear. Genesis 6 verse 4 mentions the Nephilim as the offspring of the union between the sons of God and mortal women. This union, described as controversial, could refer to fallen angels or divine figures. According to some interpretations, this forbidden connection led to the birth of monstrous, bloodthirsty giants known as the Nephilim. The Book of Enoch expands on this narrative, stating that these giants were drowned in the flood, a fate assumed by many readers due to the absence of further biblical mention. Despite their nefarious nature, the Nephilim are described as mighty men and heroes of old, potentially reflecting the awe they inspired with their extraordinary physical capabilities. Numbers 1333 suggests the Nephilim's survival after the flood, terrifying Moses' scouts with their colossal size and strength, leaving the spies feeling as small as grasshoppers in comparison. It's intriguing how the Nephilim, these mysterious and larger-than-life beings, captivate the imagination despite their brief mentions in the Bible. The snippets of information create a sense of wonder and curiosity, especially with their abrupt disappearance from the biblical narrative after Numbers 13.33. Their reputation as heroes of renown and the association with fallen angels add complexity to their identity, leaving readers pondering their fate. Leviathan, as described in the Book of Job, stands as a colossal sea creature, a monstrous being associated with a great serpent or dragon. God's detailed description emphasizes its invincibility and dominance over all other creatures. Its power is depicted through its physical attributes, eyes like dawn, flames from its mouth, impenetrable scales, and imperviousness to human weaponry. Symbolically, Leviathan represents chaos, evil, or darkness, showcasing God's sovereignty over all creation and highlighting the vast gap between human understanding and divine wisdom. The purpose of illustrating Leviathan to Job was to reveal God's power and transcendence over even the most formidable creatures, serving as a lesson in divine sovereignty. In other biblical passages like Isaiah 27 verse 1 and Psalm 74 verse 14, 
The destruction of Leviathan symbolizes God's victory over evil, restoring peace and order. The description of Leviathan in the Bible serves to underscore God's might and humanity's insignificance in comparison to the divine. Its symbolism contributes to theological themes such as the struggle between order and chaos, the triumph of good over evil, and the ultimate sovereignty of God over all creation. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.